<clears throat> Welcome everyone. This is a webinar, Local Food and Gardening Initiative for 2017. So hopefully you are a, a daycare home provider or someone in a daycare center um, who has applied for the subgrant to receive some money to do some local food and gardening and nutrition education in your in your facility uh, this spring and summer. Um, I'm Tessa Adcock, Team Nutrition Project Director um, with Child Nutrition and Wellness, and we also have um, Emily Brinkman, who's also a Team Nutrition Project Director. Um, and we have Ward on the line, who I'll introduce a little bit later. He's with K-State Research and Extension. He's a master gardener, so he'll be doing the, the bulk and telling you um, the bulk of information about tips and tips of the trade for um, for starting a garden uh, using your subgrant funds and using the education materials that we've provided for you so oh if you have any questions go ahead and type it into the zoom group chat and we'll monitor those and ask away as we go along and we'll try and um, answer those as we go So why is youth gardening important? Children have added motivation to eat fruits and vegetables that they help grow. In recognition of this, the USDA strongly encourages school gardening projects. Teaching kids to garden and grow their own produce is a great opportunity to increase their fruit and vegetable consumption. As part of our team nutrition training grant um, from USDA or United States Department of Agriculture, Kansas Team Nutrition through Kansas State Department of Education, Child Nutrition and Wellness. We're excited to help support Kansas children um, in child care centers and daycare homes to begin or enhance the gardening projects that you, um, that you may have already started. As we know, through gardening, kids can learn <clears throat> how to grow food, how to prepare food, and just making that connection between where their food comes from, seeing it grow, picking it off the plant, tasting it on site, on that on spot, is, um, is a very effective way to get kids to try new things and it's fun. The kids love to do it. So just a little bit of background on the Kansas Team Nutrition Initiative and subgrant. Um, Participating sites, if you were a child care center, you would have received a $300 um, subgrant stipend, and our daycare home providers received $100. Um, you also should have received in the mail uh, the nutrition education curriculum. We're going to kind of take a, take a minute to go step by step through what you received in your box um, as far as the nutrition education curricula. Um, if you did not receive those, please do contact us because we, I, I think I sent it out to everyone who's awarded, um, but if you have not received it yet, do let us know because I want to make sure that you do receive um, all of the nutrition education materials. Um, we're providing the webinar training today, which we are recording um, and we'll send out so you would be able to go back and view it again. Um, if there are any questions that we answer, anything like that, then those will all be captured for you to, um, to look at at a later time. Um, if at any time, during the subgrant in the spring, when you're planting in the fall or um, picking in the um, in the summer and fall, do know that Emily and I are both here. Um, Kansas Team Nutrition team are here to help you um, with any technical assistance you might need, as far as you know, how can I spend my grant funds and things like that. If you do have any questions after we leave here today, so don't feel like um, you can't reach out. Um, and then we also, Ward will speak a little bit today um, on how there are K-State um, master gardeners throughout the, throughout the state who you could team up with, who might be able to help you kind of get your, um, your garden set up and going. So this is the timeline, um, just to give you kind of a heads up on what, what it looks like for this particular project with Team Nutrition. Half of it's already passed. You sent in your applications, you've been awarded, um, and then hopefully you will have received your nutrition education materials and resources in the mail. Like I said, let us know um, if you have not received those. 
subgrant funds uh, for those centers who received um, the subgrant funds stipends. You um, receive them each individually. If you are a daycare home provider, your sponsoring organization, we sent those funds to your sponsoring organization, so they should be distributing them to you individually. Uh, we will not be sending those to you directly. If you have not received them, if you have any questions about that, um, don't hesitate to reach out. All of the funds to your home sponsors have been distributed, so they're, um, I'm sure they're on their way if they haven't, if they haven't reached you already. Um, participating, so all of those, all, all of you have received the subgrant funds. You will plant your gardens and spend those subgrant funds between April and September of this year, 2017. And then by September 29th, 2017, we do require that all subgrant participants complete an online program evaluation, um, which will outline what you spent your subgrant funds on and things like that. We're going to talk a little bit more in depth on that, just so you have an idea of what to have prepared when you do go in to fill out that evaluation. So um, one of the things that you're probably wondering, and probably tuning in today to find out, you know, what can we spend our subgrant funds on? Uh, money can be used to purchase any small gardening supplies and materials like your seeds, seedlings, potting soil, starter pots, shovels, hoes. Um, and also as you um, get further along and actually have green beans maybe that you're picking or any of the fruit or veg, um, you might not have enough for everyone depending on if you're a, a daycare center maybe with a few more kids or um, Maybe you didn't have a successful tomato plant, but you still wanted, you know, to show the kids what um, what would have come off of that. You are welcome to purchase supplemental fruits and vegetables to be able to do tasting activities, um, not only for the gardening activities, but with the nutrition education curricula um, lessons that have been provided to you. Money may not be used to purchase your bulk soil, such as topsoil irrigation supplies, any of the big equipment type items, uh, we're not allowed to, um, to use subgrant funds for those. But any of the actual lesson, lesson plan items, you are welcome to, to spend money on. Other projects besides container gardening, we're gonna talk a lot about containers today because that's a great way to kind of get going and get started. Um, but you are allowed to do other projects and you have quite a bit of freedom as long as they're related to gardening, as long as they're enhancing any sort of nutrition education, um, gardening or local food curricula, you're, you're welcome to, um, to let us know about those and we'll be excited to hear about them in the evaluation. Um, online program evaluation, it will include um, an area for you to list out how you spent those subgrant funds. You do not need to send us any receipts um, as far as what you spent the subgrant funds on. We do recommend that you keep them. Um, just file them away. Um, it'll be easier when you go in to do the evaluation to list out the items that you purchased if you have those receipts in front of you. Uh, if we ever should need to do an audit or something, uh, it would be nice to have those and they would, be, um, they would need to be there. But do not send them to us. Keep hold of those. If at the end of the subgrant time you have more than $25 remaining, please let us know. We'll try and brainstorm with you ways that you would be able to spend this money. We don't want you to ever send it back. We want you to uh, find ways to incorporate uh, some sort of wellness activity, gardening activity, something like that. So if you're running out of ideas and you need some help, let us know. I will be sending you a link to um, the online evaluation and essentially it's just a survey monkey uh, link that we're using to collect uh, this information. The information that you will need to have readily available when you go on to complete your evaluation are the things listed here. Um, just the name of the child care center or daycare home provider and your contact information. Um, information about your gardening project, what you did, um, what sort of lessons you really liked, um, anything like that. It'll be a, a box that you'll be able to kind of fill out and let us know what you what you decided to do. Um, 
if you have any advice or things that you've learned uh, through this process, if it's your, you know, your first time setting up a container garden and you learn, you learn something, do share that with us because we want to be able to have that um, to share with others who, who attempt the same kinds of projects. And also it gives us a good idea of what the barriers are for you and what, what we can maybe help with in the future uh, when we provide these opportunities. So advice is always welcome. Um, we'll give you an opportunity to evaluate the nutrition education curriculum materials that we've provided to you. Um, we would like to have any sort of tidbits in your observations of how children accepted the, um, the gardening activities and the nutrition education lessons um, that you chose to do. There is the grant fund expenditure report, which is really just uh, a, way, a place for you to go in and list all of the, all the things that you purchased, your, um, you know, your pots, your soil, what kind of seedlings or how many seedlings, um, and then just a, a general amount that you ended up spending um, for those. And we are also now, um, we are able to upload uh, pictures. So if you're taking any pictures in, in planting or kids tasting or anything like that and um, and you're documenting this this project as you go through, we always are excited to see those um, and encourage you to take pictures and share, you know, not only with us but with your families to, to have the kids see um, what they're doing when they're with you um, because it's really fun and the kids really enjoy it. You get some really cool candid shots. <clears throat> you do not have to use the curriculum that we've provided um, verbatim, but you will need to include nutrition education lessons and components in um, the gardening activities that you do choose to do. Um, there are additional USDA team nutrition resources at the links here, um, and, it, and those are above and beyond the curricula that we have sent to you in the mail in hard copy. You can download and use any of these at any time. Um, I'll send these links with in the follow-up um, email and they'll remain obviously in the recording here so you can go and check out the uh, team nutrition resource library it has a lot of really cool stuff if you're able to print yourself um, they're really colorful and, and beautiful but um, one of the reasons why we wanted to send you the resources printed too it's always nice to have those booklets and have the handouts and have everything um, right there for you so um, you could, this is another place that you could go to check out some more options. So now we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk in a little more detail about the actual nutrition education um, curriculum that you should have received in your box from us. The first one is the Grow It, Try It, Like It gardening curricula. And this was um, uh, written by the USDA Team Nutrition. Um, let's see here. So if you have the kit in front of you, even better, you can kind of go through. Otherwise, I'm going to talk through some of the, uh, just the pieces that you'll get included in that box. Um, there are theme nutrition education. It's a kit for center staff that introduces children to three fruits. So peaches, strawberries, and cantaloupe, three vegetables, spinach, sweet potatoes, and crookneck squash. Each kit includes seven booklets featuring the fruits and vegetables with fun activities through the imaginary garden at Tasty Acre Farm. It also has a CD-ROM with supplemental information and a DVD with pool puppy pups picnic and lunch parties. The image on the screen that you see here um, is one of the kits that we just pulled out and um, took a picture of, so that's exactly what it would look like coming to you. The first book in it is The Basics, which includes a teaching guide, um, ideas for garden-themed arts and crafts, ideas for searching each of the six featured produce items, or serving them, encouraging children to try new foods and polite food tasting. Um, that's especially good. We want to get the kids to be trying those things that they're growing and that they're talking about. Um, suggested children's books about gardening, gardening tips, including how to grow seedlings, starting container gardens, and gardening outdoors, which we're going to hear even more about from more today. Uh, the remaining books in that box are name, 
are names for each of the featured fruit and vegetables. So each book is broken into different sections. There's a planning chart uh, section with hands-on activities introducing the fruit or vegetable to the children through exploration and tasting. Uh, section B is planting activities. Section C has activities featuring singing, dancing, reading, and educational videos. So you will have resources to do lessons both in the garden as well as inside. Um, section D, nutrition education activities, including an introduction to my plate, the food groups, and physical activity. Tasting opportunities reinforce that each fruit or vegetable can be eaten in a variety of ways. There are growing at home materials, and the words to grow that appear throughout the lessons, so there's a section, words to grow, um, link the Grow It, Try It, Like It lesson plans um, to other areas of preschool curriculum. So grant funds may be used to implement any of the lessons presented in the Grow It, Try It, Like It curriculum, especially we're um, promoting, of course, the container gardens or the hands-on planting activities um, included. You should have also received a set of the Kansas Farm Bureau Children's Book Series. Um, these books, in these books, children can follow the travels of Kaylee as the city girl visiting the farm. Um, they offer a fun way for young people, parents, and teachers to learn more about agriculture. Um, and what's really cool about these and what we really wanted to tie in was um, the robust agriculture that Kansas has and um, really making that point to our kids and, and letting them know, um, you know, where, where our food comes from in Kansas. So we thought this would be a great way to kind of tie in a more local and a more Kansas um, at home viewpoint of, of gardening and agriculture. <clears throat> we understand that many of the container gardens or gardens that you do create will not produce enough fruit or veg for an entire site, especially if you're a center with uh, many kids. Uh, for tasting, grant funds can be used to purchase fruits and vegetables to supplement so that all children have the opportunity to sample. One last thing, um, teaching children about where their food comes from is a great way to promote healthy habits, so be proud of the gardening that you do do. We encourage uh, various means of promoting the program or your garden or just whatever um, whatever you decide to, to focus on um, to your both to your children but also to your families let them know what you are doing um, and display pictures again taking an account kind of, of of the whole process of the of the planting and um, and how the the vegetables and fruits are growing is it a, a cool thing to have up and I think the kids would be really excited you know to share that with their families so promote 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 and take pictures for us too because we want to see what you're doing so next I'm going to hand it over to Ward he's going to give you um, well a lot of information on just planting he is an expert so I'll let him kind of tell you a little bit about himself and what he does Um, and I work at Kansas State University. I, um, I do a number of things. I'm the State Master Gardener coordinate, Coordinator for the State of Kansas, as well as I'm also what is called the Rapid Response Coordinator. And what that means is that we have 105 counties in Kansas, each of which has um, agents through K-State Research and Extension. If they have a question they can't answer that relates to home horticulture, then I, they can call me and I can answer that question for them. So, uh, are we getting my presentation up? Ward, I took yours out of the middle of ours, so if you wanna go ahead and share your screen, or um, do you want us to pull yours up and just advance for you? Just a second, let me... Let me see if I can, here we are. Now, let me see if I can get that to presentation. Okay, are you seeing it now? Yes. Okay, is it, are you seeing the, 
We see it, Ward. Sorry, I couldn't get unmuted. <laughs> okay, okay. So let's get let's get growing. So whenever we talk about vegetables, we're talking about two different groups. We call them the cool season and the warm season groups. And so cool season season vegetables are um, ones like peas and broccoli, lettuce, radishes, cauliflower, all those things that like cool weather. Now we can grow them at two times a year in Kansas. We can grow them in the spring and we can grow them in the fall, but they do not like the summer. About uh, the seed of those, those vegetables, they need about 45 degrees in order to germinate. But if you get them in a little early, they will sit around and wait for that temperature to come up. Where the warm season vegetables, if you plant them too early, that seed will rot. And so the cool season vegetables are a little bit more um, easy going as far as when you put them in. However, if you leave them in too long, they will bolt or go to seed. And when they do that, they become bitter. And so it's one of those vegetables you have to get in early and get out early in order to keep the quality up. Warm season vegetables, of course, love the summer weather. But you have to wait until that soil is warm before you can put them in. So usually we're talking May, usually about mid-May, maybe as late as June before you put them in. You need a soil temperature of 55 degrees for germination. And again, if you put them in too early, that seed may rot. Also, if you get freezing or frost, uh, while those plants are young, you can actually kill them. So here's the ones that are cool season crops that you can plant in April. That includes beets and then the uh, family of cabbage, which includes cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower. Usually about the first half of April is when you wanna put those in and you put them in as, as small plants, not as seed. And then lettuce, peas, radishes, onions, and spinach. Now the lettuce, peas, and radishes, again, you can put in as seed. Onions you usually put in as, as sets, which are the little small onions, or you put them in as small plants, usually not from seed. And spinach also is from seed. Salad gardens is one of the things you may want to try with, with your students uh, because that's easy, that's going to be cool season crops, it's low cost, and it's quick. Most of those can be grown from seed and you have really quick results so that the kids can see what they have grown and be able to enjoy it quickly. They grow well, as we mentioned, during the cool season, and this is the time you want to start. Now, if you're like us, you've just gotten a great deal of rain. If you have, you've got to wait for that soil to dry somewhat before you plant. If you work soil when it's wet, you're going to end up with clods. If you're using containers, you don't have to worry about that. So what to grow in a salad garden? You can grow leaf lettuce, bib lettuce, mescaline mixes, mixes which is a, a number of, of leaf type crops, and then spinach, Swiss chard, Radishes are probably the quickest crop we have as far as being able to harvest, and then green onions. Now those are often grown from sets and you pick them early and use them as a part of a salad, or you, some people eat them raw. In the summer garden, we have our warmer temperatures, uh, but you need to shift to those warm season crops, those that grow best in the summer heat. So what we're talking about here are things like cucumbers, peppers, tomatoes, okra, sweet potatoes, squash, sweet corn. Some of these take a lot more room than others. For example, if you think of cucumbers, that's a plant that's gonna spread out because it's vining. Uh, sweet corn, you have to have at least three rows of that in order for it to pollinate and make good sweet corn. Um, and then other things, okra is a large plant, but it doesn't take a tremendous amount of room. Same thing with tomatoes and peppers. Summer garden ideas. You can make a salsa garden where you grow everything that's needed in order to make salsa or a pizza garden where you grow what is needed to make at least a vegetarian pizza. So on a salsa garden, you're gonna to have tomatoes and peppers and onions and then herbs. And herbs are not hard for us to grow, you can grow them. And then on a pizza garden, tomatoes, peppers, squash, onions, herbs. Really, if you like something else that's in the vegetable uh, area, you can grow that as well. Okay, we have a problem with those warm season grass, the warm season crops. Most of those are gonna need months versus weeks to germinate and grow. For example, tomatoes, you may put them in at early May, but you'll likely not get your first tomato until in July. Uh, usually, if you get it by 4th of July, you're doing pretty well. If you get it by mid-July, that's more common. And so it takes a while for these crops to mature because what you're harvesting is the fruit. 
when you look at a lot of those war, um, cool season crops while you're harvesting are the leaves, like lettuce. And it just doesn't take that long for them to develop as opposed to the warm season crops. So how do you speed that up? You can purchase larger plants that are more mature. Uh, they are more expensive, but they will bear fruit a little bit earlier. So you can grow a variety of herbs to add to other vegetables, as you mentioned before. We can grow basil, parsley, thyme, oregano, chives, just about anything you want to, you can grow uh, in addition to your vegetables. Okay, here's keys to success for all gardens. You need full sun, at least six to eight hours of direct sunlight each day. Now, there are crops that need less. You can get by with the leafy crops with a little bit less than six to eight hours. Things like spinach and lettuce, um, those types of things will need less. Those that are root crops, such as potatoes, need a bit more, and the ones that need the most are gonna be your fruiting crops, like tomatoes and peppers. Water is needed. You don't want to overwater. Those roots need oxygen every bit as much as they need water. Therefore, if you have a saturated soil, you can actually drown the plants. And so you want to keep that soil moist, but not waterlogged. You may need to assign watering duties in case you have some children that aren't mature enough to handle that duty. And then keep it simple, do a few things well. Probably not a good idea to grow a wide variety of crops unless you have some experience. Try to major on those things that you think the kids will like the most. If they do well, then later you can move on to a more involved project. And include the kids in decision making, especially ask them what they like to eat so that they're more likely to eat what is grown. And then keep it fun so that those kids will have a positive experience. They're more likely to um, include in, keep going and gardening if, if they have fun while they're doing it the first time. Age appropriate activities. Be sure to select activities appropriate for the age and skills of your students. Uh, and that's gonna vary uh, depending on how old they are. So with younger children, they are gonna have the shorter attention spans. Choose crops that mature quickly, such as lettuce, radishes, spinach. Radishes is probably one of the fastest crops that we grow. And with lettuce, you don't have to pull up the whole plant when you harvest it. You can pick off a few leaves and let it continue to grow and then come back later and pick off more leaves. Same thing with spinach. And so they are not crops you have to harvest all at once. Also, larger seeds are easier to handle, such as beans and squash and peas. Um, there are other crops that are gonna be more difficult. Older youth can manage those more complicated tasks, especially if they've had some experience in the past. Gardening options, you can grow in, gr in ground uh, if you have the space to do that and if you have a way to work that soil. Raised beds um, are more expensive, but if you have a place that has drainage problems, you can use raised beds. Normally, when we think of raised beds, we think of having wood around them to enclose the soil, but that's not absolutely necessary. You can just mound the soil in the middle and then uh, level it off, and that will work for a season. The more traditional gardening format gives you more consistency in soil moisture levels. When we get into containers, we're gonna see one of the um, real difficult things is to keep them watered enough. If it's not a large container, they tend to dry out quickly. You can also have a bigger garden which holds more vegetables if you have an in-ground garden. Containers, if you wanna go that way, gives the advantage of not having to dig up the site. However, they do cost, and as I mentioned before, you need to water carefully. Try to get as big a container as you can so that you don't have to water quite as much. So as I mentioned, use the largest pot you can afford, easier to maintain, don't have to water as often. You're probably gonna be watering every day once those plants get some size on them. Those plants give off water that they pull from the soil. So the larger the plant, the more water they're going to use. Make sure it has a drainage hole. In other words, there needs to be a hole in the bottom so that excess water can escape. If it doesn't, that pot is gonna fill up with water and it's gonna drown your plants. So you have to make sure there's a drainage hole there. Always use commercial potting soil, not garden soil. The big thing with that is better drainage. When you have a small root mass like you're going to have, 
with a container. You've got to have excellent um, aeration. You have to have, have the ability to get oxygen deep into that soil. And if you use a, a regular garden soil, it just doesn't have that capability. A commercial potting soil does. And so be sure to use that. Um, if you have, if you keep those roots too moist, you could have problems with root rot. That is one of the pro causes of root rot is just having too wet of a soil. So you also have, of course, more, fewer disease and weed problems. And here's the types of containers. The clay or terracotta container is the traditional container that has been used for years and years. Ceramic, plastic or synthetic, wood, and others. We're gonna go through these one at a time. So the clay or terracotta are the traditional pot. They have some advantages, but also disadvantages. So the advantages are it's an attractive pot, good evaporation through the walls. It's hard to overwater. They're heavy, which in one sense is a good thing because they're less likely to blow over, but it can also be a disadvantage because they're more difficult to move. And so um, I like to have a heavy container just because it's less likely to blow over. And in Kansas, that can be a very, very good advantage. Another disadvantage of her clays, they're expensive. They need to be stored indoors in winter. If they aren't and there's uh, soil in there and there's water within that soil, when that water turns to ice, it can break the pot. And also you may need to water more often just because those sides breathe. And so they lose more water and they're also easily broken. Ceramic are really attractive pots, but they're also heavy, which can be advantage and a disadvantage, as we mentioned before, and they're expensive. And so they can cost quite a bit. Um, and again, just like the clay pots, they need to be stored indoors in winter to make sure that they don't break. Synthetic, these are kind of a plastic pot, but they're not the traditional green pot that you get from florists. They're more decorative than that. Um, they are easy to find. You can find those you know, at all the big box stores. They're light, less expensive. They don't dry out as quickly because they don't breathe as much. The disadvantage is, is they can break. And since they're light, vandals can pick them up and carry them off. And they need to be stored indoors in winter. Again, if you get that water in there and it freezes, it can break them. Need to make sure you don't overwater just because they don't breathe. And so therefore, make sure you watch your watering a little bit more carefully. Wood containers are less common, but you do see them at times, especially like the half the whiskey barrel type thing. Um, they are attractive, they have good evaporation through the walls, and they're hard over water just because water will flow out the sides. And uh, disadvantages, they can be hard to find, they can be expensive, and if that wood shrinks because it dries out, those rings can just drop. And so you have to be a little bit careful uh, to make sure that that doesn't happen over the winter. Container price comparisons. Plastic, if we're, when we're talking about the, uh, the green plastic things like from a forest, those are the cheap ones. And so 16 to 22 inches in diameter, you can get for 10 to 15 bucks a piece. Clay is next up. It's 22 to 30 for a 16 to 18 inch pot. Synthetic is 25 to 35 or more for 20 to 24 inches. Wood, you can get some really large ones here but they also are expensive, 25 to 35 and up. And ceramic are gonna be the most expensive, uh, 18 to 22, and they're gonna cost 30 to $50 and up. And of course, the, the price is gonna vary depending on the size and the style, the finish, the color, all that type of thing. And so that gives you an idea of how much they cost, but you may be able to find a good deal somewhere. Potting soil, and make sure it's potting soil, it's not garden soil. Garden soil is not what you want. It doesn't breathe well enough. So if you get potting soil, a two cubic foot bag is gonna be about $10 per bag and up. Cheaper isn't always better in this case. Cheaper brands will use inferior materials. So get a name brand, don't get an off brand. Make sure, as I mentioned, to use potting soil, not garden soil, and check the label to make sure that's what you've got. One two cubic foot bag will fill approximately two 12 inch containers. 
So if you, you can also get those bags as one cubic foot. So if you have a 12 inch container, it take one cubic foot in order to fill that container. Gardening resources. So this is where you can find some information. If you're new to gardening, um, this little publication is very, very helpful. It's one that we put out uh, through K-State Research and Extension and it has an awful lot of information in just four pages. What I've shown you here on this page is actually page three. And what this is a representation of is when to plant and when to harvest. The white boxes is when you should plant. So notice you have a lot of um, variability there. A lot, you have a wide window to put certain crops in. For example, on the beans, snap beans, you can go from early May into the first part of June as far as planting. And then again, you can plant in July in order to get a fall harvest. Notice that as you go through this, there's a number of crops you can do that with. They are cool season crops that can be planted in the spring and again in the fall. And then the black box is of course when you harvest. And so that's gonna vary depending on whether that plant can be harvested over a long period of time or whether you can succession plant. In other words, put in um, something like beans and then two weeks later put in more and two weeks later put in more, that type of thing. So you can pick up at the extension office or download. Uh, the publication number is MF315. If you want to get it online, just do a search for Kansas Garden Planning Guide MF315 and it'll pop right up and you can download it that way. Now, if you want more extensive information, we have the Kansas Garden Guide. This is about 80 pages and covers just about everything regarded to vegetable gardening. It's, it again is a K-State Research and Extension publication. You can purchase this, the hard copy at Extension Office, or you can download it for free. It is available as a PDF. So if you just want some specific information, you can download it, turn to that page, and print off what you need. So a very good publication uh, as a good resource as far as how to grow plants, vegetable plants in Kansas. What if you don't know where your extension office is? If you go to www.ksre.ksu.edu, look for the part that says um, counties and districts offices. If you click on that, it's gonna be on your left-hand side. It'll bring up this map. You click on your home county and it'll give you the address for your county extension office. And that county extension office can help you answer questions. It can also um, uh, have publications available to you. And if there's a master gardener program in that county, they will have information on that. So on that website for each county, if they have a master gardener program, they'll have it on the website. So that's one thing to check out. If you have a large population center in, in your county, you're going to have a master gardener program. But many of our smaller, uh, smaller units also have a master gardener program, the smaller counties do. And so don't assume just because you live in a smaller county, you don't have master gardeners, you very well may. We have about 50 of the 105 counties that have an active master gardener program. So we can help you with specific concerns. In other words, we can answer your questions if you have problems. You can purchase publications or they may have them available for free. You can have your soil tested for a small fee. Usually it's about $6 for a basic test. And as I mentioned, some offices have extension master gardeners that also are available to answer questions. Now, master gardeners do not do the work for you, but they are an educational organization, so they can help you with teaching. So, here's where you find our information. You go to that uh, website I mentioned before, and then you click on lawn and garden, um, and then that brings you to this page. And then over on your left, you can see all the different things we have available for you. Here's the Horticulture Information Center. This is this, the place where I try to bring all the information together that relates to gardening. Um, we have a lot of different departments at K-State and several of them handle gardening information. For example, horticulture, of course, does that, but also entomology, plant pathology, uh, Kansas Forest Service, uh, has information. All of that's included on this one page. So if you're looking for information, you can come here and uh, 
be able to find it. If you're interested in horticulture, the Horticulture 2015 newsletter is published 50 weeks out of the year. So it's published weekly, except for Christmas and New Year's weeks. And it covers the problems that we're currently seeing, as well as tips on how to do uh, certain tasks at certain times of the year. And then also there's a Kids of Cooking site that you can visit in order to find information on cooking. And if you need any more help, you can call me. That's my contact information, phone number, as well as my um, email address. Okay, any questions? Thanks so much, Ward. We haven't had any come in in the chat box so far, but um, do you plan to hang out with us for until two o'clock, just in case? Sure, yep, no problem. Okay, great. Um, if you wanna stop sharing, I will pull mine back up real quick. Okay. Okay. That was some wonderful information, Ward. I learned a lot that um, I think I'm going to take back home, and Tessa and I were just talking about planting our own gardens at home, so that helped me out a lot, too. Um, we're just going to spend a few minutes at the end here talking about some, hand, some tips for handling produce safely, um, just to make sure that when you are doing some of those tasting activities with the kiddos that um, we're making sure we handle it in the safest way possible and um, no contamination. Oh, there you go. Okay, so contamination of produce with harmful microorganisms can occur at all stages of production, processing, transportation, storage, preparation, and service. So to prevent foodborne illness, we do need to make sure that fresh produce is handled with care at each step from farm to table. Everyone involved with growing and harvesting produce from the garden should be trained on basic food safety practices, including hand washing, glove use, personal hygiene, cleaning and sanitizing, and handling ready-to-eat produce. It's suggested that um, you, you keep an eye on any of the um, site gardens that you have going on and just make sure that anybody that's involved with that with the kiddos does know some of the basics about making sure that's handled properly. Good hand washing practices can go a long way in keeping ready-to-eat foods such as produce safe. Um, and we encourage that you definitely don't allow anybody to work in your gardens on site while they're sick. School personnel, or sorry, your site personnel should decide whether single-use disposable gloves will be worn while picking the produce, in addition to good hand washing. Although it's not required, um, we do find that this provides another layer of protection and is recommended. Harvesting containers should be made of materials that can be cleaned and sanitized before and after each of your classroom activities. Um, do not use garbage bags, garbage cans, or containers that are not intended for food use while you're harvesting those items. You should clean your harvest tools such as knives and scissors with soap and water and store them in an area that prevents contamination before and after each of the garden activities. The resource on the screen does say that it's for schools. Um, it's the best practices handling fresh produce in schools but it can provide useful information to anybody handling produce. Um, this resource comes from the Institute of Child Nutrition and it includes recommendations for purchasing and receiving, storage, hand hygiene, washing and preparation, and service of fresh produce. Specific attention is provided to leafy greens, tomatoes, melons, and sprouts as those have a little bit of a unique um, need for the um, handling safely. We also encourage you to check out our website at www.caneat.org um, for a link to all of our gardening resources in one location. Again, it does say farm to school, but um, any of the food safety resources and gardening tips that are on there are applicable to you no matter whether you're a school or a child care center or a daycare home. Um, USDA, the Food and Nutrition Services, has a web page that is devoted to farm to preschool. If you go to the website listed on the screen, you can find many resources to help implement um, your farm to preschool efforts in um, your child care center or your daycare home. Um, it'll provide information such as national statistics, grant opportunities, procurement information, fact sheets, videos, um, and they're adding more to it all the time. 
So um, we definitely encourage you to check that out and learn how you can use local food and learning in the early childhood setting. Finally, one other resource that we have available from KSDE is the Kansas Fruit and Veggie Quick Facts Book. This was developed for the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program in the um, school nutrition setting. Um, so it's under, on candy.org, it's under the Fresh Fruit and Vegetable Program. But again, it would be applicable to any setting, not just schools. Um, the book was developed to aid in nutrition education for that program. And it provides information on 40 fruits and vegetables that are grown in Kansas. And it's available free for download from our website. So it provides some information on each of those 40 fruits and vegetables, such as um, growing information, fun facts. Um, some of them even have cute little jokes at the bottom for your kids. So um, check that out if you're looking for some more information on especially Kansas grown fruits and vegetables. And then finally, I just want to end it with Tessa and I's contact information. Again, we're the Team Nutrition Project Directors, and we're here to help you with any information um, you need on what you can spend your subgrants on. Um, Ward would probably be the gardening expert, but we can definitely help out with just information on um, using those funds, what's allowable, what's not. Um, and we absolutely love to hear what's going on with those projects. So um, call us, email us anytime, share what you're doing, ask questions. Um, we are here for you guys. So I am going to unmute the phone and unmute um, I'm going to try to unmute you on the webinar as well so that you guys can ask questions um, or you can continue typing those into the group chat as well. So give me just a second to unmute. Ward, we have a question on the chat box. I don't know if you saw it. Um, they were asking if you're in the Kansas City area, if there's a good reason. Oh, sorry. No, that was just a comment. If you're in the Kansas City area, a good resource <laughs> is the Kansas City Community Gardens. Yeah, and I saw the um, question about the soil testing. Yeah. Usually, usually it's about $6. There are certain counties that subsidize that. In other words, it may be cheaper for your county. You just have to check. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Um, I did not. Oh, oh whatever. Okay. Lots of feedback. Okay. I just tried to unmute everybody and that caused a lot of feedback. Um, so if you are on the webinar, unfortunately, I think the best way for you to ask questions is going to be through that chat box. But um, that is all we have for you. If you need to hop off, that's fine. Or we'll hang around for a few more minutes and just see if anybody thinks of questions. Um, for those leaving, thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing about your projects.